Black lights and booze burn when I record for watch And every black like Troy Davis who never had a fair shot All black everything, everything black Culture over everything, y'all, we taking it back Welcome to Left of Black. I'm your host, Mark Anthony Neal. We're joined today by Professor Anthony Reed, Associate Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. He's the author of Freedom Time, The Poetics and Politics of Black Experimental Writing, which was published by John Hopkins Press in 2014. And he is joining us today to talk about his most recent book, Sound Work, Race, Sound, and Poetry in production. That's Duke University Press 2021. Of sound works, our friend Margot Natalie Crawford writes, offering a new way of thinking about Black sound work as an understanding of text. Anthony Reed makes a deep theoretical intervention in Black studies by opening up the role of recordings in the Black aesthetic avant-garde. The beauty and appeal of sound works lies in Reed's fresh focus on the records that allow us to hear the more ephemeral and unrecordable situation of Blackness. And that's again, our friend Margot Nelly Crawford, author of Black Post-Blackness, the Black Arts Movement in 21st Century Aesthetics. How are you doing today, Anthony? <laughs> I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing well. Um, um, this uh, book is a mouthful, for lack of a better way to describe it. Um, talk a little bit about how you get to the path of SoundWorks. Um, you know, I started working on this, actually, the early seeds are in my dissertation. I was, right, which became Freedom Time. I just discovered that people like Cecil Taylor and Nathaniel Mackey, I have a chapter on Mackey in um, Freedom Time and a chapter on Cecil Taylor with Gene Lee and Soundworks, that there was just this whole archive of sound recording. And other than Alden Nielsen, it didn't seem that people were really giving it its due, but it also seemed that um, this was, in the break had come out in 2003 and phonographies had come out recently at that time. And there was a, a, a very exciting conversation and I thought there was an opportunity to really dig in and think about medium, but I had to put it on hold to write Freedom Time because it didn't really make sense in that context. But I was excited finally to return to it and then to develop this way of thinking about medium on its, on its own terms and as its own project. You know, there's a way in which people might dismissively look at some of the work from this po this moment where you have these poets working with Black musicians as, as jazz poetry. Um, you describe it as something very different, particularly in the hands of someone like Archie Shep, you know, call it phonographic poetry. Um, talk a little bit about that concept. Phonographic poetry was one of those, I'm, I'm usually hesitant to coin terms, but phonographic poetry captured something that um, I think is important and it's about um, ways of understanding poetry in performance that, do, that don't treat the printed poem as a score. That kind of, um, later Brent Edwards has written about, um, I think he's talking about Sterling Brown and the ways that you can interrupt, some of these practices interrupt the distinction between um, poetry as structure and poetry as event. And I, I thought that with people like Shep, who was so easy for people to write him off politically or to just kind of contextualize everything that he's doing out of existence, that it would be worth saying, actually going into the studio, collaborating with musicians, this traces a whole history that can um, deepen our understanding of what's going on alongside and sometimes at variance with the explicit politics of the, the performers and the poets. You make a, an important claim, I think, that this music, which you describe as, as sound works, right, the labor of making this mu music in this particular moment, is not simply a reaction to what's going on. Um, but as you write, you know, it's really calling for a more prescriptive act, uh, audience, right? It's calling for Black collective uh, action. And, and it's difficult to think about how that plays out because these are folks who don't don't necessarily know what that audience is going to be and what it's going to look like. That is one of the difficulties. I think, <laughs> to, to be perfectly honest, my model for that is something like the riot. That, and by that I mean that there, I have been um, accustomed to thinking about politics, literary politics. My training is to think in a very cultural studies way and to really 
um, especially early on, and I've had to kind of work my way through and out of this to look for moments of resistance to right. existing phenomena. And I wanted to say, well, part of what's interesting about the avant-garde, if we take it seriously, and so, at least some of the people did call themselves avant-garde, if they're the, the advanced guard of a formation, there's no way that they know what's going to happen. It's really right. about creating, right. Right. creating the circumstances within which something else can take root, within which a new formation could um, flower and blossom. And there I really do read against the kind of vanguardist impulse. A lot of these people are strictly Leninist or they're following people like um, Robert Williams mm -hmm. to try to build the people in a certain way which doesn't really work for people like Cecil Taylor or people who come later, but that there is something about, if I can reattune your way of experiencing um, art, your way of experiencing the world, then we'll be ready to um, move together to, to whatever is gonna okay. come next. And I mean, when you talk about this in, in terms of Cecil Taylor, right, this idea, form is possibility right by opening up the form <laughs> it's it, it opens up possibility and you don't know how folks are going to react to it you know just yet in that moment i mean exactly and i think to to come back to it was through cecil taylor that i started to really think about the riot and the riot because as i got deep into some of the historical research, like the contemporary 1960s mm -hmm. and 70s discussions of Black power and some more contemporary ones, the riots, the uprisings in Watts and Detroit and Newark and elsewhere really are what people most wrung their hands over because those are the moments where it was revealed the people maybe aren't who we thought they were, <laughs> that they, they don't really correspond to the images that the leaders are, are promoting. And so, there's a way that they were paying attention and what they decided to do with the um, this, the situation that they were in was entirely unpredictable and unpredictable. Yeah. I mean, in the way that even as historians, you know, even as cultural historians, we're always looking for the smoking gun, <laughs> you know, that, that sets off Watts, right? That sets off Newark, right? That, you know, sets off Harlem in 1943 or, or something along those lines. And, and I think you make an important claim when we think about this in a musical context, in a cultural context, it's never ever that simple. Um, that the artists themselves are not just responding, right? And so we could make a claim that, that Coltrane is responding to very specific events in Birmingham when he writes Alabama, right? Or even Nina Simone, even more so, right? It, to those same events, right? And writing Mississippi Goddamn. But but these are artists that, who are not necessarily responding to singular moments, right? They're taking a collection of these moments and, and trying to imagine, you know, what a future looks like outside of it, right? And, and the music does that kind of searching work. Exactly. I mean, I think, and also there's no... There's no way to determine in advance, okay, so Alabama, why? We know that Coltrane took the text of uh, Martin Luther King, um, I'm not sure if it was a eulogy or a speech after the church bombing, right. and used it to create that tone poem, but the actual sonority of it, the sounds and the what he's drawing together, that they were, Elvin and Jimmy, Garris, Elvin Jones, Jimmy Garrison, and Claire Tyner would kind of establish that drone to just create that right. space. Right. There's no way to talk about why was that the right form to set that tone poem or what does it do to audiences to sit in that because it's a yeah. much longer stretch than you would hear, um, say, in a similar moment during church service. You might have the organist behind the minister hold the note on that, on that Hammond but Alabama holds it to almost excruciating when he finally yeah. gets to the end yeah. um, and yeah. moves to conclude is such a relief, yeah. at least for me as a listener, that it, it makes me understand like, man, I really just went through something um, when I finally get to that point. I, I was struck by the fact that, you know, as you got deeper into this project, you made the decision to start to study music theory and, and to play the saxophone. Um, what was that experience like? And, and what did it actually contribute to you being able to produce what you produce in, in, in the book? I'll say my, my initial training was as a drummer mm -hmm. and, you know, in, in high school. And so I understood rhythm pretty well, but I thought people are making claims about <laughs> 
the, the tempered scale. They're making these claims about what's changing and shifting in the music. And I wanted to really, I thought it was gonna be more central than it ended up being. What happened was when I actually started to study and I was studying with people who are very rooted in um, traditional, mm -hmm. in quote unquote traditional, by which I mean people who are really invested in and wanted me to understand functional harmony, the so-called, what Charles Mingus refers to the circular form, where you, know, you start at the top and you go through a series of changes and you end up logically coming back to the beginning. Mm -hmm. But what happened was when I, I had that training, I understood voice leading, I understood lots of complicated music theoretical concepts. And then when I went to listen to the music, I realized, oh, they just threw all that out the window. <laughs> like there was one moment I was trying to transcribe um, the New York Art Quartet and I was listening to, um, this is what I'm gonna get wrong. So we might need the edit button. It was Louis Worrell, I think. Yeah, Louis Worrell is on bass. And I was listening to him and I thought, oh yeah, okay, he's playing in like F minor or something. I think I write about that. And I went to my music teacher and I was very proud of myself that I had transcribed all these notes. And he listened to it for about three seconds and said, you think this is in a key? <laughs> and it was, it was humbling, but it was also, it made me understand so much fell into place. When you get rid of circular form, so as a drummer yeah, trained right. in that tradition, you mark the top of the form for the soloist. That's one of right. the jobs as a drummer. But when you don't have to do that anymore, you really can right. interact much more freely in an open way and kind of be in the moment in a very different way. And I understood that. And I understood from there how to listen to Cecil Taylor and how to listen to some of this music that yeah. had dared for eluded me, but also understood there are really multiple traditions of the so-called avant-garde because there are people like Lester Bowie who's coming out of an R&B context and really you need to be sharp and understand this is going to recapitulate and you have to be ready. You can't just, you know, explore in an open-ended way and that that's something else. You know, you just mentioned Lester Bowie and I, I just wrote a piece on uh, everything must change right and I'd forgotten that you know they do a version of that you know with David Peason you know singing vocals on it and you know there's a way in which even though we think about Lester Bowie's avant-garde right he's clearly in conversation of what we think about as these more vernacular traditions right and so when you talk about the idea of a vernacular avant-garde um, uh, unpack that a little bit for the audience yeah it was what I was trying to get at there um, at the risk of, so I'm just gonna, I'm gonna set up an interlocutor and I'm not trying to set him up as a, as a straw man. <laughs> Eric Porter right. has, a, has an excellent book. Um, what is this thing called? This is it called Jazz, yeah. It's truly remarkable. And I was struck though by his discussions of Archie Shepp. He has a moment of talking about the record Fire Music from 1965, which has a, cover of the girl from Ipanema. And he has this kind of offhand comment, like there was no risk of that becoming a hit. Ha, ha. <laughs> and I thought, well, actually the girl from Ipanema, as it turns out was one of, I mean, if I don't want to say it's one of the first but it was truly a, just a global yep. smash. It was, like, right. it was unavoidable. Right. And right. Um, like, there was no way you didn't know it whether or not you knew what it right. was called. And so if we think about, if we take seriously, why would Shep cover this song? And he talks about the Brazilian tradition and he loves the major sevenths and technical stuff, but also what it does is it takes something familiar, a huge yeah. hit like right. the Girl from Ipanema, right. and uses that to say, hey, if you can get to that, dig what we're doing one step over here. Yeah. It's really yeah. inviting people to use what they already have and what they already know and saying, why don't you follow me here? In the same way that Max Roach with um, Andy Bay, members don't get weary. They do this sort of uh -huh. uh -huh. of different gospel songs, including uh -huh. gospel songs that were key to the civil rights movement. And it's like, hey, why don't you follow us over here? Right. Right, or even Nikki Giovanni's Truth is on its way. Yeah, right. Great examples yeah. of that. I, I was struck again thinking about Archie Shepp, and particularly that chapter where you write about Archie Shepp and Montana Roberts, um, that the relationship that these avant-garde artists are having to audiences are so fundamentally 
different, right? So they had access to all these indie, you know, publications, these little magazines, these independent black magazines that that covered them, right? And there's a wealth of these things and very diverse readers and and that allows for avant-garde music to circulate to a much broader audience than we think about that music circulating today, when we almost think about it exclusively as being the byproduct of, you know, conservatories, right? Mm -hmm. And and those very traditional structures of of listening to quote unquote formal and informal classical music. That, and here I wanna wanna shout out Richard Eiton's work, which was really Mm -hmm. pivotal. That you made a very important point, and one that's very important to me is that one reason the medium and media is important to sound works is that that's really the precondition for all of this. That you have people starting maybe with Leroy Jones, who becomes mm-hmm. a very baraka and blues people, and in Downbeat magazine complaining about the white critics who are not doing right. justice to the music and really wanting to displace the white gatekeepers. And what they did is they formed their own journals, um, or they found editors who were friendly to to them, like Negro Digest, and are able then to really help um, seed the ground for listeners who at least will be curious. So, you know, how does a listener know to pick up fire music in the first place? They might've read that interview in in Negro Digest or in Downbeat and found their way, but building um, independent, self-sustaining media was was key, as was, and this is what I really learned from Richard Eitner's work, building the guilds, workshops, and uh, forms of mutual aid that while at times people did get funding from the Ford Foundation or from Johnson's government, they could also sustain themselves to a large degree. And that made it much more plausible that there would be an audience for, not only an audience who would listen to this music appreciatively in that music appreciation way, but who would really be able to get into it and really be able to feel like it was their music as Ornette Coleman said. Right. And in a way, right, you know, taking a page from the work that that Thomas Dorsey did a generation earlier with with the gospel workshops and the same thing that, you know, Reverend James Cleveland is doing in the 1960s. How do we build sustainable models, right, to to push this music out, particularly music that might be deemed, you know, very non-traditional? to some audiences. Um, in, in that same scope, you also talk about the challenges of, of artists working in a very particular media ecosystem, which almost makes the argument to why this stuff can never simply be seen as a reaction to the moment. Um, because when you record it out, you don't know when it's coming out. <laughs> <laughs> right there, there, there's you know there, there's a kind of immediacy with the live performance that is more important to build upon than the expectation that an album that you do for Blue Nora Impulse is not going to come out for another six months is going to have that same impact. And it's I mean very much, very much so. And to your point, I just it was recently the anniversary of the recording of Cecil Taylor's Conquistador record. He recorded it in '65, and it doesn't come out until '68. So that they're in between which he had done all kinds of other things. So it's like book publishing, but in a way um, even less predictable. Like we have a book contract, the book is gonna come out. It wasn't even clear Blue Note shelved so many albums right. um, that we still don't have. So that they really needed to have ways to get in front of audiences and to kind of build some of that excitement, and, to build and, and, some of that uh, buzz. And, and no real rationale explored in terms of why some of these labors, you know, shelved what they shelved. Um, you know, are they re- responding to market forces? Are they responding to what they might deem as something that's overly political and militant in the music? And I think the challenge is you talk about, you know, for cultural critics and historians writing about this, you know, we tend to write about this music when it hits, when people hear it. Right. You know, when it it gets known in the world. But part of that is writing to what was the artist actually working through in that period of time, you know, that they're responding to that's very different than when it actually comes out. I remember very much. I mean, that's that is an important idea for the book. And behind it um, is the sense that I think as cultural critics, as cultural historians, to think in different and maybe more capacious ways about history 
and about the different things that could be going on. And yeah, exactly about that interval between when is it conceived? When do they get the band together? Do they have the band that they wanted? Did the label make them? You know, there are all kinds of stories, especially in the 80s and 90s of labels encouraging, like, well, you, we right. can't do the record without so-and-so being on it. Right. Like, there's all of that stuff that's part of, that they're almost at odds with labels, mm-hmm. especially major labels, and especially going forward, um, like after this moment, when they're, when the independent media stops being self-sustaining and people are forced to rely on the blue notes, the impulses, um, the aristas, and so on, that they're really negotiating to get their music out in the first place. You, you mentioned artists like Mantena Roberts, right? And, and it's a different, you know, media ecosystem at this point in time, right? You know, she doesn't need a record label in the same way um, that Archie Shep and previous artists did. You know, there are things like YouTube and streaming services. Um, but you also mentioned that that she arrives in the moment where the kind of assumptions that those earlier generation artists could make between, uh, you know, a black radicalism and aesthetics and a black radical politics, you know, she can't make those same kind of assumptions in 2013 with Coin Coin, you know, the way that Archie Shep and so many other artists that you explored could do so in the 1960s. Um, talk a little bit about that dynamic. Yeah. Um... I, I wanted to include Matana Roberts just to just to make that point that as <laughs> cultural critics and we need to think about these moments are different, but also that she cut her teeth listening to people like Shep, so right. that she's she is and her bandmates are in the in the continuum. But right. as musicians, but also as listeners who came of age, she's about my age. So she would have come of age and really been learning to play right. during the great moment of um, platform change when the cassette gives way to the CD and things are right. really reissued. Back catalogs become newly available. So it's contemporary to her, but there isn't that yeah. underlying sense. I mean, so much changes. The entire kind of class makeup and just geospatial makeup of Black communities shifts. Yeah. Um, after the 60s and because of things like the highways, because of things like what integration does and so on. And really I wanted to have a moment in the book, which is mostly about the black arts era and its immediate aftermath to kind of look forward and say, this analytic might not work in the same way with somebody who's more contemporary, that there's still some work to do to think about. I mean, just to say, it means something different for her to mm-hmm. make an album, a series mm-hmm. of albums dedicated to an enslaved ancestor. It's actually, as I say that out loud, it's hard to imagine Archie yeah. Chef or Joseph Jarman or whoever, Gene Lee, anybody making a record dedicated to an enslaved <laughs> ancestor in the 60s. Um, in part because those people were still alive in some right. cases and wouldn't have liked it. Right. Or they were, they were, I mean, there's just a, it's, Thinking about that, like what are the conditions under which it becomes possible for her to conceive and then make that project in that way um, is one of the things if nothing else, um, I hope people come away willing to kind of think about with me. You you write about Amir Baraka and obviously these d- different moments in his career, Leroy Jones, Amir Baraka, you know, when he let go of cultural naturalism in the 1970s. And, and one of the things that I learned right, was the big surprise to me was, was this, uh, this song, this single um, that comes out from the advanced workers of the anti-imperialist singers. <laughs> Talk a little bit, right? And first of all, just just listening to it is like, wow, Ray Baraka made a disco song, right? Marching in the street, marching in the street, Rockefeller Day. <laughs> and they went. So I'm still I'm still trying to find more concrete information about it. I'll just say that that song is it has a ghost like quality in my life. I remember having a conversation with colleagues about it and then weeks later going back and them saying like I didn't talk about that with you so <laughs> one of the things that may or may not be true therefore I and mean, that's the kind of caveat 
I understand that it had members of Cole and the Gang um, right. were involved. And, and, <laughs> Somebody claimed, and I don't know if this is true, that it, some of the people in the band had been um, had worshipped at the mosque from which Malcolm X's supposed assassins came. There's wow. like a whole lore, and of course, those the supposed assassins have been exonerated, so that there's. Like layers and layers of history. Of the idea there, yeah. that they they went to the studio and recorded the disco song, and it's it's <laughs> actually good. It's really danceable, and it's these brothers chanting. Yeah, Ma was in Linus and Musty Dun. I can't even do it in time. I mean, I'm not a musician right. in that way, but it's right. just right. incredible. <laughs> incredible and, and a real sensitivity like to and i mean and that's one of the things we think of with that particular generation sonia sanchez nikki giovanni baraka to some extent you know hakeem abudi the, the sensibility they had to what was happening on the streets and trying to write to the streets right and for baraka to take that to a next level let me record a single right and, and i'm curious to find out you know did it even get any airplay <laughs> That I haven't been able to find out when I was in touch with with archivists just to get mm -hmm. a good copy and to find out what I could. And it's really hard to track where that goes. I do know just from kind of informal YouTube research, they went on tour. Wow. There, you can find whole concerts of them like mocking Nixon from the stage and playing their songs and with seemingly large and enthusiastic audiences. Audience. Yeah. So it's yeah, not. This what, isn't like. Oh yeah, we just we got a band together for a vanity project. They were on the stage in a in a big way. Yeah. Uh, talk a little bit. You know, where as you were doing the research for this, you know, were there things that that you assumed that you would be writing about and that you would talk about, and and the research forced you to think differently about some of the assumptions that you made coming into the project. Um. I mean, I, naively, on one hand, I thought it would be easier to, <laughs> um, to just understand, to, to track all the different labels and who was involved. And so very quickly, I found out, man, these are not people who kept records. They did mm. not. There was a, you know, Strata East, which I wanted to write about, has been getting some print. And That's just like, right. nobody wanted to be bothered with all of that. They just right. stuffed stuff in boxes and kept it moving. So it was a lot more painstaking just to figure out who's really involved, when are the sessions, and how did these things circulate? There are questions like, was this stuff played on the radio that I just couldn't, I yeah. couldn't find the answers to? I, I mean, there's a way in which, just as you said that, you know, it made me think that for a lot of these labels, and, and these presses, I'm thinking about Black Jazz label along with Strata East, you know, it, it, it was almost as if it was a maroon operation. Right. The, the idea that they knew that they were doing something that was transitional, that wasn't sustainable, but but served their needs aesthetically, economically, politically in a moment. Uh, and when they could no longer sustain it, they just moved on to the next thing. They wanted to get back to to making their art. Maroon operation is, is perfect. It was they saw that there was a need to do it. And then they started doing it and realized, man, this is a lot of work. And yeah. as they found, <laughs> but that so um, like, and this this extends into things like Kurtzheim Records and uh -huh. kind of other independent um, black record labels. That as those records got commercial attention, I think it was easier for those musicians to negotiate contracts with other um, other publishers. And right. so, while maybe they came to it in a spirit of Robert Williams saying that we need to have these independent self-sustaining institutions when it became time when it came down to it these were musicians they were artists and they didn't really want to get bogged down in the day-to-day -day, yeah. um dealing with just front of the record labels a lot of paperwork and i can't really imagine that these are people who wanted to do that when they could have been right. just on the road right it could have been on the road yeah um you know this is very much an, an archival project. I mean, the range of the archives that you address is, is pretty extraordinary. Uh, what were some of the frustrations? 
organizations that you found, you know, in this case, not even just trying to find supportable documentation, but literally the fine sound, <laughs> you know, the, the challenges about that. And, and what were some of the joys of, of going through that archive for yourself? Um, it, you know, my path, my path into the music is sort of unusual. And so in a way, one of the things that I was really happy about was that my way, I didn't have people sit me down at their knee and say, listen to this boy and, you know, turn on the record player. It was just, I found a record I liked. Who are the, who are the musicians? I'm going to track down those musicians and see what else they did. And so that, just having that ability really um, was helpful, but also finding that there's a whole set of unconnected communities online of people who maintain um, out of print records. So the records like, there was a group out of St. Louis that I didn't end up writing about, but I hope to when I can address the black artist group more directly. They put out really beautiful records that were on a very local label and they might've only had a thousand or less or fewer printings. And so finally getting my hands on that and listening to yeah. like David Bowie's brother and some other, um, did I say David Bowie? Lester Bowie. Lester brother. Bowie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and and <laughs> maybe David Bowie is a brother too, but um, really getting to finally hear that and to really feel my own understanding of what music in the 60s was shift. Mm -hmm. I really came away. I so I mean to, to answer this in your previous question, I had an idea of what was happening in the 60s and, and I was pleased to find that I just didn't know, I didn't know the first thing. <laughs> yeah. I had to really rebuild from scratch and really could track all kinds of un, unexpected connections and reverberations, like finding out Beaver Harris, who was a great drummer associated with the avant-garde, also played with Thelonious Monk. Yeah. Like making some of those connections and really undoing the um, rough and ready periodization into which mm -hmm. I've been trained mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and being able to, I hope, effectively present at least some of that to audiences to kind of expand. Like this is actually a lot messier and more interesting yeah. than we've been led to believe. I, I got a different sort of question for you. You, you know, one of your primary interlocutors you're raising a family with. <laughs> um, <laughs> what's it like having you both work in some ways in the same space, right? Uh, Emily Lordy's work is more popular, right? Working with popular music, you with more avant-garde experimental music. Um, what have you been able to draw from each other's work, you know, that's been beneficial, at least in your case, from Emily's work, to talking about the, the music that you're talking about and the period that you're talking about? Yeah, I mean, we, it's funny. Um, we don't really share work in progress with each other. Yeah, that's just I not get that. Been, I get that. Uh, <laughs> It's, it seems for the best, actually, now that I think about it. But we do talk a lot about just what's happening and kind of share notes on who the people are, what are the events, and kind of are then able to piece together, like, well, I have my partial balance formed from these archives and these people, yeah. and you have yours yeah. from these. And then we can together um, really, I've really benefited from that because I think I have a fuller sense beyond the kind of, you know, I love Henry Baraka, but some of the ways that he talks about the, the so-called Negro middle class in the 60s, um, <laughs> he had an ax to grind. And I wish yeah, as a scholar yeah. he had been, because he was a great scholar, I wish he had been more curious about that beyond yeah, his sense yeah. of the sound and what the sound was supposed to tell us. Um, and being in conversation with Emily has really kept me attuned to that. It's really made me stay open and stay curious about what's really going on. Let me not rush to the conclusion yeah. that I want to draw. Uh, you know, your comments about Barack and his critique of the, of the Black middle class <laughs> made me chuckle because um, I can remember remember a comment from Ishmael Reed uh, probably shortly after Baraka's death. Uh, and, you know, they had a very interesting kind of dynamic theory in their relationship. But he's like, you know, for all of that kind of radical politics, he had an American Express card. <laughs> it's like, well, yeah, right. <laughs> it's, yeah. 
that's I mean that stuff is I, I think we all have to live with our contradictions. They're just right. Right. There, there are all kinds of ways that Baraka as a person is much more complicated for me yeah. as an intellectual right. hero than Baraka as a writer. Baraka as a writer, this like it's much easier to be like, yep, I like this, I dig that, I can get down right. with that, this is good. And right. but learning the particulars of him as a person, like all of us, right. love live with right. these contradictions. And I think that my my approach is, and this is related to, I mean, I've generalized, if I've learned to be more open and more curious from being in, in conversation with Emily, I think that that's extended to my own desire to just be more compassionate, like yeah. willing to be critical yeah. of people, but yeah. not as fast to just be condemned, to be condemning. And dismissive, yeah. Yep. And dismissive, I, that. I think that there's, there's just a way of saying like, you know, yeah, he, American Express, long, complicated history with the CIA um, and so on, that the Baraka who's critical of the Pan-African movement in the 70s, it's like, you should have known better. But right. Baraka, the person with a large family living in Newark, who doesn't have a secure academic position and who's having right. trouble getting his work published, how is he going to bridge that gap between, right. between being paid? Right. right, he's just like the rest of us and relied on the credit economy. So wanting to contextualize some of those contradictions and tensions in a larger project, I think is, is what, um, one thing that I really try to do. Yeah. What's next for you, Anthony? I have a couple of things that, that I'm working on. And one, I just, I just wanna say to you personally, like directly, I am really excited for your book to come out. I, oh, all I know is the title. I mean, I know a little more than the title, but all I need is like Mark Anthony Neal, Black Ephemera. Uh, I'll take two of them, please. So, thank, thank you for that. Um, no, I, I really, I'm really, really excited. Um, but for me, I, I'm co-editing an anthology of the work of Langston Hughes for Cambridge, Langston Hughes in Context that I'm excited yeah. for. There's some good, good work in there. I think, I hope will really help move the conversation on Langston Hughes yes, yes, um, yeah. forward. I have a couple of books. One is I want to start to really think about the 80s and 90s. I think I'm now ready. I've been dancing around it in both Freedom Time and in <laughs> Sound Works. It's like I have to kind of deal with, so this is the period of my own intellectual formation. And right, I really right, want to right. think about um, you know, I grew up with Black nationalist hip hop and I've learned to be critical of it, but I kind of want to understand, so where did that go? Right. Um, and yeah. if there was this moment of real Black internationalism, I mean, in middle school, it was still free South Africa until right. Nelson right. Mandela himself was in Tiger Stadium. Yeah. Right. So just, okay, what happens to that? How yeah. do we think about a kind of global black community in practical and aesthetic terms? Um, perhaps this would be an opportunity to historicize the rise of diaspora studies and to really think through some, um, some of the lingering and unresolved questions there. So that's, and thinking again with Richard Eiton's work as well as we're almost at 30 years of the Black Atlantic. I think it's right. time to really return to and think about that, and but also to think about how does it look if we look at a different period, but also include places like South Africa. So if apartheid, if anti-apartheid was one way that people organized and understood global blackness, what happens when apartheid is not there anymore, but also the right. Soviet Union and the kind of Soviet model isn't there either. Yeah. Um, the other is that I'm still kind of figuring out what's the archive, what's the scope, and I had a colleague once say of something else, that's a 10 year book. This might be a 10 year <laughs> book. book. And since <laughs> as being tenured, I can afford to say, you know, absolutely. I'm just gonna let this, I wanna do it right. The other thing that I really want to do is a short book um, that I'm thinking of in terms of black lyric theory, mm -hmm. which is um, both about poetry and thinking about where African-American poetry, but also where global Black poetry is, and really testing the hypothesis. So it seems, and people like um, 
Charles Raub, great editor of Callaloo, promote the idea that there's been this shift to revaluing the personal and a shift in effect to a kind of lyric sensibility, um, short poems shaped around um, intense experiences that for Raul and others is really shaped by experiences with the academy. I kind of just want to test that and kind of read widely, but also think about poetry in that broader sense that Robin Kelly teaches us via Amy Césaire, that it's about changing how people think. And so what would it be to put um, different configurations of the personal that perhaps also are in music um, in this conversation? And what kind of becomes available? What resources might lyric theory as it exists give us for thinking mm. about um, these other often more difficult, more fraught forms of relation? I mean, Adorno, Theodore Adorno can write about the lyric that it's the, um, it expresses social antagonism and a social antagonism that the writers might not be aware of, that doesn't really work with African-American writers. There's, there are very few people, no matter their politics, um, who are unaware of and aren't in some way consciously being asked to address the antagonisms around them. So that's, there's a kind of two-way need. Not only do I wanna draw on lyric theory, but maybe revise it so that it actually yeah. suits these other populations. We've been joined today by Professor Anthony Reed, Associate Professor of English at Vanderbilt University. He talked to us about his latest book, Sound Works, Race, Sound, and Poetry in Production, Duke University Press 2021. He's also the author of Freedom Time, The Poetics and Politics of Black Experimental Writing, published in 2014 by John Hopkins University Press. As always, it was great talking with you, Anthony. Yeah, likewise. Thanks for having me, Mark. It's great to see you. You're welcome. Good to see you too. Black lights and booze.